I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be here with you this uh, uh, time to share with you the Word of God. Even at this time, as we meditate on uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew, uh, chapter 18, uh, we see God engaging with His disciples. Before we get into the text, shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Oh Lord and Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, th thank you for your word, O oh Master. I pray that will open our hearts and minds to receive your word. And through everything, let your name be glorified. I pray that it will speak to our hearts and transform us into becoming more like you. This I ask in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, it says, At that time, dis the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is this? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, we see uh, the disciples want to know who is the greatest. Uh, the, they probably were assuming that at this time that uh, um, Jesus was going to establish a kingdom. Uh, most of them by this time have been uh, uh, were sure that Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, he had established that step by step he was teaching them that he was the Messiah. Now, um, they were walking to Capernaum. Uh, Luke and Mark add some more uh, details to this. And they said they are going to Capernaum and have been arguing amongst themselves who is going to the, be the greatest uh, in his kingdom. Um, while we cannot fully evaluate the motives, Jesus could be... Uh, we, Jesus used this moment to illustrate something uh, to teach an important lesson to his disciples. Uh, the disciples uh, came to realize that Jesus really was the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus began to prepare them. Uh, he, after that, after establishing that, he began to prepare them for his death and resurrection. The understanding was uh, budding, but they definitely had a lot more to learn. And perhaps they thought that Jesus would soon establish his earthly kingdom and uh, where um, uh, they were vying for positions of prominence in his kingdom. So they were trying to figure out how or who would be at uh, uh, the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus gently re redirected their uh, misguided motives. Uh, in verse 2 he says, he called a little child and had him stand among them. So, he uh, creating a visual image, Jesus is creating a visual Im image to underscore uh, his words. Jesus called a little child to him and placed a child among the disciples. He kept, he kept the little child there. He did not rebuke them for their short-sightedness. But uh, uh, instead, as a master teacher, compassionate savior, he taught them in a powerful way. Jesus' words offer a call to repentance and conversion because he says a child like uh, humility is necessary to enter God's kingdom so truly I say unto you unless you change and become like children you will not enter uh, the kingdom of heaven what are uh, what are little children like what how, how are they uh, they are humble and they are dependent uh, surviving by simple trust in those who take they trust in the most probably they, they would be trusting in their parents for everything they need at that when they are uh, children and uh, so they are not uh, uh, little children wait for someone to fix their food and feed them they have little control over their existence they don't they don't think they are in control they know they are dependent on someone they trust someone to uh, provide for them and to uh, uh, and to they are dependent on them children are not uh, great and powerful by this world standards uh, in the ancient world children did not have any value until they could contribute uh, to daily work if they work then they they they, they were uh, uh, considered as someone otherwise they were not considered at all of any value at all um, unlike most modern cultures where we adore uh, children 
uh, adore children and treasure them. In those days, a child was best not seen nor heard. So Jesus set a startling example by giving value to someone deemed of little status. Now he's giving value to them, the little ch children. He illustrated his point with a little child, uh, uh, likely a toddler, and he was not advocating childish thoughts or prolonged immaturity. That is not what he, he, he did not say that you should become like a child means you should have childish thoughts or become immature. No, that's, that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus upheld the value of all people and our utter dependence on him for physical and spiritual survival. That is what he, want, he looked at. And when you uh, are, where, when you repent and when you come to God, you look to God, you look to Jesus for survival, both spiritual and physical. So that's what he's uh, suggesting here. Jesus went on to describe true greatness in his kingdom. Whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He, he talks about humility. Uh, we live in a world that exalt self, self advancement, self sufficiency and things like that. We are taught to be, uh, promote ourselves, not humble ourselves. However, human pride is actually a barrier to greatness in God's kingdom. You, you cannot have pride and you, you, you cannot go up in God's, king, God's eyes. Jesus tells his disciples and he calls us to turn from selfish pursuits and humbly trust him. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us in this. People who abandon self to seek Christ will also learn to love and serve others. Yes, when we uh, don't seek self uh, things for ourselves, then we learn to love others because when we are in Christ, we need to love others. The highest fulfillment possible in this life is found in utter dependence on God. There is nothing greater. We need to depend totally on God for every area of our life. Then um, he says, and whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Now what is Jesus saying here? First Jesus commanded that those who welcome once a child in his name. Jesus' union with his uh, uh, disciples is so great that he equates uh, kindness offered to his little children as offered directly to him. If you offer kindness to believers or to Jesus' disciples, it is like kindness offered to Christ himself. These words commend a uh, humble service extended to people of lower status. Jesus did not limit the little ones to uh, children. He also included those who are insignificant in this world or world's eyes because the world rejects those who believe Christ. Those who uh, believe, uh, they are the ones who are reg regarded as the little ones. The disciples previously worried when Jesus offended the Pharisee. They asked Jesus to send away the hungry crowd and other people, honoring those whom the world uh, fails to esteem defies our human uh, inclination. Christians still struggle, struggle with this, but are called to see people as God sees them. Are you able to see uh, people as God sees them? It is something very different from the way we see. We see with selfish motives, we want something for us, but to love and serve people and to look at them with the eyes of God, even though they are low in status, but uh, uh, who, those who believe in Christ, how are we treating them? Are we kind to them? Are we, are we able to humble and be with them? So that's what God is. No matter the position in the world or church, believers are called to put, a, uh, put others before themselves. So we are asked to put others uh, before ourselves. The utmost desire would be that Jesus himself is known and honored. So another one uh, he says is, do not cause these little ones to stumble. So he says, um, the Bible describes God's love and care for his children as his jealousy. 
God's jealousy motiv uh, motivates his preservation of his people from harm and from other things that draw them away from him. The natural response of a loving parent is to protect the child from danger and danger and harm, hindering a believer or putting obstacles in his path of faith is a serious offense to God. God's heart is always turned towards his children. He, he is looking at them. So, um, the little ones are precious in his sight. Our thoughts may go to those who are uh, literally little ones. Children need care and protection. It is important to invest in the spiritual uh, training of children. Awareness how, of how our words and action might become obstacles to faith uh, could be of vital concern. It, it means that if we are bringing up uh, children in the faith and if you are a parent, you need to live life which is pleasing to God and which will not become an obstacle to your child. If you are doing, uh, uh, it means you need to lead a righteous life. If there are things in your life uh, which is not pleasing to God, your child might also pick it up very soon. And is that the right thing to do? He will go away from righteousness. So, we need to be careful that we don't um, be the cause of them stumbling in the faith. We need, we need to be very careful the lifestyle which we live. So, because the little ones are precious in his sight. The bottom line is that believers are responsible for their influence on others. How is your influence on others? Is it something good which, will, which you like others to follow, which is good in the sight of God or you want to hide um, or you don't want to take any responsibility? This is my life, that is their life. I am not worried. Are you with that attitude sitting there today? But today, let's Look at a life which is pleasing to God and which will not be a stumbling block to others. That is what Jesus says, it is better for you to uh, uh, take a, put a millstone around your neck rather than cause one of these little ones to stumble. Instead of causing one of them to stumble, he said you better drown. These incredibly strong words illuminate the severe judgment awaiting for those who lead other into sin by negligence, deliberate intent or personal examples. So sometimes we are negligent, that also causes them to sin. Sometimes we, with deliberate intent we make them sin or a personal, the lifestyle you live is a cause for others to sin. So we need to be very careful. Sorrow awaits a person who chooses to put obstacles in the way of another faith. If we put obstacles in the way of another faith, we are sure to face judgment later. Then he goes on in verse 8 to 9, he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed, crippled, uh, than to have both hands or both feet and be thrown into hell's fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you uh, to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. Now what is Jesus trying to say? Is he trying to ask us to mutilate our body if we sin, if our hand sins to cut it off? The words look like that, but it is a figurative thing which he is talking about. He is saying, uh, <clears throat> it looks extreme, but Jesus explained this. Uh, it is better to go through life maimed or crippled than to hold on to what causes you to sin he, and be thrown into eternal fire. Jesus was not advocating self-mutilation, but speaking figuratively. There is nothing worth preserving at the expense of righteousness. So we need to be careful. No habit, no relationship 
no entertainment or comfort is more valuable than being near to God. Too often, we try and see how close we can walk at the edge of sin's cliff without falling off. We try to be on the border. We don't want to be away from, totally away from sin, but we dabble with sin. We come close to sin. We see how close we can stay so that we will not sin and we depend on our own strength. We think ourselves stronger than we really are and dabble with sin's poison. Casual tolerance of sin does not work. Patterns of sin become a painful uh, part of our identity and security. Sin's diminishing returns will lead us into the deepest sin if we do not turn to God. Take personal sin seriously. When God reveals sin, repent and run into his arms. Repent, turn away from sin and run towards God. Don't persist on that, don't argue, don't try to justify what you do is right. Just turn from your sin and run to God. Otherwise, it'll, there is danger which awaits you. So, he says you don't uh, sin and he, he asks us to deal with sin. Uh, he takes sin very seriously. So, he wants us to live a life without sin and how to stay away from sin. And we need to deal, if we find that there is sin in us, we need to deal with it ruthlessly so that we will be uh, righteous in, in the sight of God. Jesus' discourse continued as he explained how to protect and care for his children. He offered uh, a parable to explain the lengths to which we must go to seek little ones, the spiritual peril. He then gave specific instruction on how to deal with sin uh, to preserve unity and purity in the church. This is something which happens, we will see that uh, uh, there, there is sin in the church too. So he's trying now from personal purity, he, uh, 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 sin, he is coming. One of the first one is do not be an obstacle. The second one he says, uh, your personal sin, you need to deal with it ruthlessly and get rid of it. The third one he is saying is about sin in the church. If uh, he, he, he talks about uh, uh, purity in his church. Christ little ones are of great value to him and Christ's children are so important that his, he dispatches angel, angelic attendants dedicated to serve and protect his people in love what God, uh, uh, to love what God loves we must passionately love and protect his children. Then he goes on uh, to talk about the parable of the lost sheep. He says, if a shepherd owns 100 sheep and one of them goes away, uh, he would leave 99 of them in order to go to the hills to rescue one lamb who had wandered away. When he found and brought the little lamb back to safety, the shepherd would be happier uh, about the rescue of the one sheep then about the 99 which did not go astray at all from the fold. The shepherd's jealous care and patient search for the wandered sheep represents immense effort and even risk for the sake of only one sheep. The context of Jesus' parable tells us that he is talking about the expending effort to restore a Christian brother or sister who has wandered away into sin or, spirit, or is in spiritual danger. A person who's gone away, maybe 100 people are there but one has gone away. Maintaining spiritual health within the community of believers is a priority matter. So he had just thought about our accountability regarding causing little ones to stumble. He will go on to teach about the path of restoration and forgiveness in the following verses. Believers should be willing to put forth their effort to see even one of his little children to return to spiritual safety. 
we need not, we should not take advantage or we should not uh, cause them to sin but we also need to restore them back that is what he's saying and when we do that we reflect the heart of our heavenly father and like the shepherd we rejoice greatly when god preserves and restores even one so sometimes we think one is okay let him go or let her go so what god is interested god to god a child is very precious to him so it is good to to restore like the shepherd went after the sheep we also need to go and try to restore them then he goes on to talk about the uh, sin in the church in um, uh, 15 to verses 15 to 20 uh, we see this uh, um, happening it says so if your brother sins against you go and show him his fault uh, just between the two of you if he listens to you you have won your brother over but if he did not listen uh, take one of one or two others along so that uh, uh, take along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses if he refuses to listen to them tell it to the church and if he res- refuses to listen even to the church treat him as you would a pagan or someone outside or as a tax collector that's what jesus says the problem of sin in ch- church so how do we uh, restore um, a conflict and sin can easily hinder fellowship with god and with others now believe uh, with other believers jesus thought that the unity of his people demonstrates the power of the gospel of the world to the world how is that unity preserved jesus gave practical tips um practical uh, steps for god's people to take them when they face inevitable conflict and sin within the local church or between believers it is tempting to ignore or avoid issues that divide us how are the seriousness of sin and purity of god's people uh, must always be kept in view jesus calls believers to love each other oh well this requires humility and active intervention when anything threatens to divide or corrupt the church when something is corrupting the church or when something is dividing the church we need to intervene is what he says anything threatens to divide or corrupt the church the restoration is so important that jesus said earlier that a believer should not come to worship until first going and making peace with a brother or sister for him relationship in the church is very important he says he offer, offers practical advice he says first we need to talk to them privately so first privately you call them and talk to them and say and tell them what they are doing is wrong but if they are not willing to listen take two more people as testimonies and ask them and uh, join with them and as a group probably you could confront them and tell them that this is what is dividing the church this is not what is not uh, right and uh, if you tell them and if they uh, repent and come back then it is fine but then uh, if they still don't uh, uh, confess or uh, repent or they still in that same way the third thing they say uh, jesus says is tell it to the church let the church deal with them and the church the whole it says the church um will deal with them but uh, even if they don't accept that then treat them like you would treat anyone outside like a tax collector most issues should be resolved at the or within the church or privately or with more than someone the motive is approaching someone who has offended you or is caught in a sin is not merely personal reconciliation a renewal of a relationship with god for all involved is the goal they will they have to be renewed with god that should be our goal uh, many small offenses should should be overlooked and forgiven for the sake 
of unity within the church. However, humble care for other means not overlooking or tolerating serious disobedience to God or wrong inflicted upon others. <coughs> the goal is to turn the ba person back to God's way and to renew his rela relationship with God. That's the idea of uh, restoring a per person back to church. So we, we try different sources and uh, uh, including the church, confrontation by the church. But uh, for if they come back, then it is. Otherwise, we can. Um, a believer who walks with God looks beyond their own interest to show humble love and concern for others. When other believers sin, it is um, loving to humbly confront the sin and seek restoration. The unity and purity of Christ's church matters to God. Then Peter comes and asks another question. Uh, he says, um, Peter, uh, Jesus teaching on a believer's responsibility to reach and to restore one another, God, Peter thinking. He says, how often must I follow this pattern? What if someone sins against him repeatedly? Jewish rabbis commonly thought that people should forgive others up to three times, after which no forgiveness needed to be offered. Peter's suggestion to forgive a brother or sister up to seven times probably seemed amazingly gracious. Jesus said, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. He answered, his answer must have shocked Peter. Anyone who repeated an offense uh, 77 times or more surely had a deeply ingrained pattern of sin. Was Jesus just expanding the limits? His answer reflects in 1 Corinthians 13.5 where Paul wrote, Love keeps no record of wrongs. The point was to stop counting and to establish a habit of forgiveness. We need to forgive. Jesus expanded and illustrated his teaching with another parable. This is another parable of the unmerciful servant. We see um, um, the unmerciful uh, servant. It talks about uh, um, a man owed a king an incomprehensible sum of tremendous amount of money and which was totally beyond the ability of him to repay. The amount equal to 187,000 years of work at the average workers wage, wage pay in the ancient world. He pled for mercy and the debt was forgiven. On his way home, this very same man met someone who owed him a small amount of money, a little over four months of wages. He was given pardon for so many years of uh, wages. But here was for four months of wages and rejected cries for mercy uh, from the one unable to pay. What did he do? He ordered him being thrown into prison. When the master or the king heard this, he called him back and uh, he put the unforgiving uh, servant back into prison. Jesus drew the truth that since we have been forgiven, the forgiven must be forgiving. Because we have been forgiven and Jesus paid our debt on the cross, we must be forgiving. Our Christian communities are to have a gracious, forgiving spirit towards one another, even as we seek to be righteous before God. A willingness to forgive others is not natural. In faith, we look, look out just for our own interests. But the spiritual health, what we should look out for the spiritual health of others too. God calls his children to reflect his heart towards others. People who have been freely forgiven, learn to forgive others freely from the heart. We need to forgive others. Sometimes we don't forgive and that is what God wants us to do. So we've learned the lesson about who was great and then we talk about conflicts. Uh, first sin in ourselves, then purity in the church, 
and then forgiving others. Let that be our lifestyle. Let us not make other people stumble. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Lord and Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. Lord, thank you because you told us that we need to trust in you to totally, O oh Master. I pray that you'll enable us to do that. And I pray that we will be people who are peacemakers, who will restore people. And I also pray, O oh Master, that we'll be forgiving people, forgiving people in the community, so that your name will be glorified. Let us help us to forgive as you forgave us, O oh Master. This we ask in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Till we meet again next week. Thank you.